I've recently changed my mind about how to best handle training volume. And if you've reached a plateau in your progress, make sure you watch till the end of the video because I have a troubleshooting approach for you. What's going on? My name is Josh Pelland. I'm both an exercise scientist and a strength coach. And currently on the scientist side, I'm pursuing a PhD in the realm of training volume. And then on the strength coach side, I'm helping lifters of a wide range of levels, whether that's a lifter looking to achieve a spot on the national stage or a busy parent looking to squeeze out some gains during their busy schedule. And in this video, I'll discuss some interesting findings in the volume research specifically, especially ones that have challenged some of my previous assumptions. But as we often talk about on this channel, the research will never, will never tell us exactly what to do. So I will be sure to draw on the strength coach side of things as well in terms of what I'm doing to get my clients the best results possible. So in the past, I was pretty strongly in the camp of keeping your training volume or the number of sets you do per week for a given muscle relatively static. However, I've become more intrigued by the potential benefits of short-term changes in training volume. So let's go ahead and start this video off with some pieces of research that really kind of got the wheels turning for me. So first is a brand new study from Ennis and colleagues. And if you're in the evidence-based sphere, uh, you know that this is probably the most discussed paper at the moment. People often refer to this study as the quote unquote 52 set per week study but in actuality, if you look at the average volumes, they were closer to 21, 30, and 34 sets per week for the quads. But the point I want to make here is that those higher volume groups added either four or six sets every two weeks, whereas that lower volume group stayed at a constant volume. So we can't say whether the hypertrophy results that leaned in favor of the two volume progression groups here are due to the higher average volumes the volume progression, or some combination of the two. The likelihood of volume progression contributing here becomes more convincing when you also consider a study from Scarpelli and colleagues that came out in 2021. In this study, each subject had one leg that did a standardized 22 sets per week, and the other leg increased their volume by 20% compared to what they were doing before the study. The condition with the 20% increase in volume saw significantly greater hypertrophy than the group with the standardized volume, despite these two conditions having similar average volumes. And as you can see here, 10 of the subjects saw greater growth in that plus 20% leg, four saw similar growth between their two legs, which was defined using the typical error of measurement, and only two subjects saw better growth with the standardized volume approach. The next study that made me really interested in this concept was a 2023 meta-analysis from De Camargo and colleagues. So this wasn't an experimental analysis, but instead what's called a retrospective analysis. So a research group that has done multiple training studies in the past also had data regarding the volumes that 68 subjects were doing before the study they participated in. So they can basically look at each individual and see how much they increase their volume um, for the study, right? When they started week one of the study and how much they grew as a result. And of the 68 subjects, some decreased their volume, some increased it a bit, and some increased it a lot. So one of the analyses that they did was what's called a cluster analysis, where they looked at the average percentage gain in subjects that decreased their volume increased it by 50% or less, or increased it by more than 50%. And in the table you can see on the screen, you can see that the groups that increased their volume saw greater muscle growth. And this difference was significant in some of the analyses that they performed. So put simply, there was a general relationship here in that higher changes in volume led to greater gains. And this was confirmed through a correlation analysis. All right, now for the caveats. I'll be the first to say that the evidence here is preliminary and there is a lot of variability in the findings overall. Some of these analyses are confounded by the absolute amount of volume performed 
And as someone that's done research interviews asking subjects about their pre-training volumes, I know that these are not an exact science. And in that meta-analysis from De Camargo, there was a lot of variability amongst the subjects. And I'll note there's also evidence from abstract data that has failed to replicate the Scarpelli data. So all in all, it's possible this effect of changes in training volume isn't necessarily a top tier training variable, but my opinion is that there's probably something here that is at least worth considering. I also find this general concept of increases in training volume to align with some interesting mechanistic research. For example, we have data suggesting that as you train at a certain volume, some pathways associated with muscle growth become less potent. But this seems to be restored from time off of training and potentially from lower volume periods. This enhanced response has been demonstrated in untrained participants in a study from Ogasawara and colleagues in which some subjects trained for 24 weeks straight and other subjects trained for six weeks, took three weeks off, trained for six weeks again, took another three weeks off, and then finally trained for six weeks one more time. And while the subjects did get smaller after the three weeks off, they saw an enhanced response in those retraining periods and ultimately ended up at the same spot in terms of muscle size, despite doing 75% of the total work compared to that group that trained continuously. Ultimately, we don't have all the answers in the research, and we simply don't know if average volume is all that matters or if we should worry about volume cycling. And I say volume cycling specifically because if you're going to leverage these short-term increases in training volume, you can't just do that forever. So it's going to require periods of coming back down to lower volumes to reset things and potentially resensitize. And one thing I've become convinced of from my coaching practice is that lifters can often benefit from pushing the envelope in terms of workload, such as volume for hypertrophy or pushing heavy loads for a power lifter. But it also may not be realistic to always sustain that. So again, this results in building up and then pulling back at times. And one thing that's cool about a volume cycling approach is that it's unlikely to be worse so long as the average volume over time is similar. So it's a neutral to positive effect. And again, if we look at that Ogasawara study I mentioned before, it seems that quote unquote worse weeks of training stimulus can be recovered quite easily because you get an amplified response after those suboptimal weeks. Similarly, a study from Coleman and colleagues found similar gains despite one group taking a week off halfway through. So they did less total training, but again, ended up in a similar spot. With all this said, the one downside of volume cycling to note is that it does add complexity without a guaranteed return. So if you're looking for the simplest possible training approach that's going to be very effective, I wouldn't worry about volume cycling. But if you've reached a plateau, it may be worth a shot. It's what allowed me to get my arms to break 17 inches and it's helped in breaking multiple muscle growth plateaus with clients that I work with. All right, so here's how to do it. Simply take one to two muscles, ideally muscles that you're confident have plateaued, and just slowly add sets each week. I find myself adding about two sets per week for these muscles on average, depending on how the lifter responds. You could add more or less than that. And then you could go for anywhere from say four to 10 weeks, again, depending on how the lifter responds. So for example, if your previous program had 10 weekly sets for your quads and then maybe you deload and then you're easing back into a new program and you have an introductory week of say eight weekly sets, you could slowly add sets and maybe you end up at 20 weekly sets for the quads. So at the end, you're at double your previous volumes, at which point you can assess how the experiment went by looking at visual indications, any metrics you have such as circumferences and gym performance for your quad training. And of course, be smart here. There's no need to risk injury during experiments like this. Some lifters will tolerate this much better than others. Um, and also don't jump to higher volumes. You don't need to force the volume progression if you're, you're feeling beat up. So don't jump straight into it. 
Don't just add sets for the sake of the experiment. Make sure you're being smart um, and n there's really no need to roll the dice here, but it is an, an opportunity to push the envelope uh, for a short period of time. I also generally like to progress volume like this on exercises that are a bit easier to recover from. So for example, if I'm adding quad volume for a power lifter, I'll do most of the set progressions on accessories like a leg press, and that's instead of doing a volume progression like this on the main squat, which you could do to some degree, but again, it's, it's probably not where I would focus the volume progression for someone like a power lifter. So all in all, even though the research is definitely not a done deal on volume cycling, I find myself using this approach often because most lifters have priorities or weak points anyway. And what I've outlined is essentially a specialization routine, which allows you to push the workload more on your weak points. And then for other muscles, you can just keep it constant in terms of the training volume at a level that has proven to work well for the lifter in the past. Now, to be clear, while I think gradually adding sets in the short term can be a fruitful experiment, that doesn't mean that if you decrease your volume, you're automatically doomed to lose muscle. This was a worry I know I had when I started training and learning about progressive overload and, and different concepts. Um, but you don't need to be at your all time peak volumes to see muscle growth. In fact, a recent review paper from Hammert and colleagues, uh, points out that studies that have an average decrease in volume in their subjects still see uh, significant growth when you look at all the subjects together. So don't mistake me for saying that you need to add sets to grow any muscle, but instead as a useful experiment to try higher volumes, specialize certain muscles, and see if you res just respond better to this sort of approach. Also, honestly, I think it makes training really fun, which is worth something. To summarize, performing sufficient volume definitely matters the most, and this volume should be enough to get you stronger over time. For some folks, this may be just a few sets a week for each muscle, uh, whereas for others, it may be on the higher side. Then if you run into a plateau and you want to specialize a muscle group or two, or you just wanna push the envelope to see how you respond, consider a gradual increase in sets and see how it goes. All right, guys, that's the video. Make sure you subscribe, drop a comment with some topics you'd like us to cover in the future and we'll see you in the next one.